I was just thinking uh, since morning how many styles of lecturing you have experienced and whether you have been able to analyze what styles different members have used. So if I roughly ask you what style do you think Professor Gadre used, what is your answer? What style do you think he used? It was interactive, inductive style, inductive style probably. And if you go to Professor uh, Menakshi Gupta, was it inductive or deductive? What do you think she did? I mean, like her learning styles, hers was a combination of the global and the linear, sequential and the comparative. And in Professor Bapert's, I felt overwhelmingly it was a global style that he used and then came down to smaller finer points which leads me on to the subject that we are talking today which is different lecture outlines. If I ask you one more question I really seek an important answer from you. Do you think teaching is an art or a science? It is an art. Why? Why do you say that? Why is it an art? Yes so Rajni. Same stuff can be uh, taught in different ways. Same stuff can be taught in different ways. All right, it's the most effective way that others can understand. Is that what makes it an art? Is it also a science? It is a science. Okay, you feel it's a science. Why? Because uh, we have to have methodical approach. Mm. It has to have proper planning. Mm. It has to be concise. All right. All right. It's so, a thank you. So, she, Omar's point of view is that it's a science because you have to. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to that. <laughs> I'm coming to that. She partially means, but she feels overwhelmingly it's a science also. Because there, definitely, I agree with what she's saying, because there is a science of constructing our lectures. Definitely, there is a very scientific method which we all use in order to construct our lectures more effectively. And the art part comes in the aesthetic sense that we render in a lecture. Now here are five lecture methods and the reason why I am sharing these outlines is because like I said yesterday, a structure is intrinsic to good lecturing. A structure is good, leads to good lecturing. That if I can teach from a framework, my students can internalize the information more systematically and as a result retain that information to be able to remember things for a long, long time. So I had given you one outline yesterday, but I don't want you to limit yourself to one kind of outline because there are several different lecture outlines one can use. Therefore, I am just going to take you through five different outlines and leave you to decide what you would like to choose to use when. And in these options you will find lots of fun. It is a fun thing. Lecturing is a fun thing. Meaning we need not feel burdened by the act of lecturing or preparing for a lecture. But if I have different kind of options by which I can teach my students, they stand to benefit a lot and I get pleasure out of it. Now the first method that I am going to talk about is the comparative lecture method. How many of you use it? Just as I look at it or you look at the slide, how many of you do think you would use the comparative lecture method? You know, this is a method we use when we are comparing two aspects which almost seem to stand on similar planes. Yes, you said something? We all do. You all do, right? Now, I, I want, to, want you to be aware. We, we have to become aware of these kind of structures so that we can use them more consciously than we have been using them earlier. So it could be A versus B, but in this case, I am going to take up a comparison between a, a management theory X and theory Y to illustrate my point. And, and in this particular method, 
you have the introduction like yesterday I said begin with a friendly opening and you tell your students what to expect in that lecture and then you share the four or five characteristics and summarize the similarities you summarize the distinctions and the distinctive features and then you sum up as to which one you would like to use so the example that I have before you is taken from Douglas McGregor's XY theory which is very popularly known in management you know let me ask you very often you may have heard the statement or made one yourself that students today are a very casual lot that our generation was very serious very hard working but today's students are not hard working I find this uh, observation made about faculty also the older faculty will always say that the way we work, the way we were committed to things, you don't find younger faculty committed that way. Uh, and actually the roots of it are in theory X and theory Y. What is theory X? Theory X is the perception of an individual where they believe uh, that people don't like to work, they like to avoid work they uh, would like to run away from responsibility as far as possible okay so there is this belief that unless you are at them unless you um, take the stick around or you for discipline them and you follow them around people are not going to work this is theory X but this is a very authoritarian and uh, control controlling style and uh, contrasted with this we have the theory X. According to theory X, people want to work. You know? Now this is the exact opposite, that people want to work. People want to work, they are, they, they are motivated to work and it's your leadership style that can demotivate them. Right? So now supposing we were to make these comparisons, uh, then I would need to use the comparative lecture method where I would list out the characteristics of the one that in theory X, if I am a believer in theory X, uh, I am authoritarian, I am repressive, I control, I do not allow space to my juniors or my employees or my students and in contrast if I am in theory Y then I encourage my students, I motivate them, I encourage my employees, I lead them to self-development. It's not a controlling style but an evolving style. I treat them like mature members. So it's like a wing balance. As I put stuff in this pan, I put it in this pan. So on both sides I weigh it equally and then I give you some parameters. It enables you to decide A, whether I myself I'm a theory X person or theory Y person and like that how about the people around me what do I perceive can we classify people according to these theories and if I am made aware can I change can I change my style so this is how one may use the comparative lecture style I've just taken an example from management but in your subject I'm very sure that it could come in extremely handy and uh, I would encourage you to use it more consciously. The thesis lecture method is the one I gave you yesterday where you had a friendly opening, the topic is declared and then you have your main arguments and that's a particular thesis that you have uh, suggested with its implications and they give the outline and you restate the main argument with implications and you take up one implication, two implication, three, three implication and you discuss them with examples all the while or with analogies and then you sum up and say finally I believe that this is the thesis. Uh, take the example of 2020. Uh, the people who chose to put Dhoni as the captain, if they were to use the thesis lecture method they would say that we believe that a young captain like Dhoni will be a very motivating captain that is their thesis and then they would give the implications what does it mean 
he is young, he is energetic, he can take decisions, he is cool headed. Okay? So they decide on these parameters as they have observed him that he has a certain personality which will be able to lead, with which he will be able to lead youngsters like him and come up with the kind of results that were later on proved to be right. So thesis is an argument and when we are taking up a particular argument and we want to prove a certain thesis, this particular method is extremely handy. Uh, the third lecture method is the problem centered lecture method where I begin with an introduction, okay, the usual friendly style and I have a certain problem to be resolved. Now I could discuss the causes, solutions and procedures. What I want us to observe is that these are structures which further, further structuralize everything that we are talking about. That everything that we are talking about is placed in a classified manner and in a framework. So if I can do that when I have a lot of information and I classify it systematically in these particular fashions, it becomes very easy for my system to retain that classification system and the, they are able to use it to write notes. So you have a solution A, you have the procedure, you have the examples, exceptions and uh, summary and then you can go on to solution B, procedure, main points, examples, exceptions and summary and you go on to solution C and procedure, main points, examples, exceptions and summary and then you can decide which of the three when you have finally analyzed them all is your preferred solution or procedure. And so at the end you have to make a certain decision and this particular one can be uh, can lead to a lot of discussion and suspense in the classroom because the students don't really know which one you are finally going to opt for and you gradually lead them down the path by comparing, analyzing, weighing, uh, saying well not this finally and not this and not this but, but this, that kind of, neti, neti, neti but it is this and you come up with that kind of a conclusion and the students feel ah I got, I saw light kind of thing. So this is another method one can use and then you have the sequential method uh, which consists of a series of linked statements leading to a conclusion. Now all lectures, good lectures are supposed to be a series of linked statements that lead to a conclusion but here we have uh, steps and procedures and summary. and. As you move down, you come to your conclusion and the sequential method is especially useful for historical accounts. So you are writing the history of science or you are talking the history of aerodynamics or of electrical engineering. You could use this particular method to talk about the different phases of its development. It is useful in the sciences, it is useful in maths and it is useful in engineering. So the sequential lecture method, to make this method interesting, we bring out the relevance to other topics. Why, why would you, you know, if you bring out the relevance to other topics when you are uh, discussing something that adds to the value of this particular, the insights, the historical origins can be discussed and the applications and if you if you can see the beauty of the subject then that could be the last stage. Like there are people who have been able to show the beauty of a mathematical calculation to their students. So that particular aspect is possible in the sequential lecture method. Uh, and then you have the classical method where you have four main points after the introduction and you have in this particular section three sub points in the second section, in the second point you have two sub points, in the third point you have two sub points and the fourth point remains by itself. So all these taken together are the different structures and outlines one can use. But remember that these are the frameworks, they have got to be filled up, this, this is the scientific planning, but they have got to be filled up artistically with examples with real life situations, with problems, with uh, body language, with performance. So 
these this is where the science of lecturing comes and the art of lecturing comes okay so these are the five uh, lecture methods that i wanted to share with you briefly today so that you have a wide variety to work on but having stated that that you can use different frameworks i would still insist that while you guide your students from the framework point of view build in the artistic point as well if you have any questions i answer them but i don't want to detain you longer uh, we have already run out of time uh, if you have questions i'd love to answer them otherwise we can break up yes yes you can take up different topics and use different methods yes that's right depending on what kind of topic you are taking you can you can use one you can even use a combination of one and more there is nothing sacrosanct like you can use the comparative method and the classical method or the sequential method and the and the comparative method the thesis method and the classical mode you can combine them it's not as if they are watertight compartments any other questions